Tonight's sermon is part five in our series on, on the uh, five solas of the Reformation. And this is solus Christus, solus Christus, which is Latin for in Christ alone. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, I was talking to my good old Uncle Oli a little while ago, and he was telling uh, an old story about his, how his great-grandfather, who was also named Oli, and his good buddy Sven's great-grandfather, who was also named Sven, how they came over together on the boat from Norway around the turn of the 20th century. And they landed at Ellis Island, these two young men, in, in New York Harbor there, and they, they had to stand in line at an immigrant processing center an immigration officer would decide if they were going to be allowed into the country or if they were going to have to get back on a boat and return to Norway. Well, they finally got up to the officer and Oli decided to go first. And the officer said, what's your name? And he said, Oli Olsen. And the officer said, and where do you come from? He said, I come from Stavanger, Norway. And the officer said, and what was your job there? What did you do? And Oli said, I was a diesel fitter. And the officer said, well, we can always use more diesel mechanics. So he stamped Oli's passport and he let him go on through. And Sven stepped up next and the officer said, what's your name? And he said, Sven Svensson. And the officer said, where do you come from? He said, I come from Stavanger, Norway. And the officer said, and what was your job there? What did you do? And Sven said, well, I worked in the ladies' underwear factory. And the officer said, well, well, we have lots of textile workers in our country. I don't really know that I should allow you to come in. And Sven was shocked. He said, but you just let my buddy Oli in, and he worked at the same factory where I worked. And the officer said, well, he didn't tell me he was a textile worker. He told me he was a diesel fitter. And Sven said, yeah, that, that he was. We worked next to each other on the assembly line, and when the underwear would come down the line, it was my job to hold them up like this, and it was Oli's job to say, yeah, diesel fitter. <laughs> Looks like Oli's grandfather found a creative way to get into America there. And I'm glad he did. <laughs> but tonight I want to talk about a different place, a place that we all want to get into. And there are no creative ways in. There are no back doors, there are no loopholes, no mistakes. There's only one way in. The place that I'm talking about is heaven. And the one and only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ. That's the title of my message tonight. Solus Christus, in Christ alone. On the night before the crucifixion, Jesus ate the Last Supper with his disciples. It was the last time that he would be with them before their whole world would be turned upside down. Now, of course, they would see Jesus alive again after he rose from the dead on Easter Sunday. He would spend 40 more days on earth before he would ascend into heaven, but those 40 days would be very different. Jesus would not be with them constantly. He would come and go in a series of what we call post-resurrection appearances. So this night, the Monday Thursday night, that supper would be, would be their last time together before everything changed. Judas had already left the upper room to, to go about the, to, the, the betrayal of Jesus. It was just Jesus and the 11 remaining and he wanted to prepare them for what was coming, what was about to happen. He wanted them to know that, that, that even though he would be going away from them, he would be going back to heaven, that they were going to be okay, that, that the Spirit was going to be there, they were going to be fine. And, and so he spoke these words that are recorded in John 14 that I read just a couple minutes ago. Let not your hearts be troubled, he said. Believe in God, believe also in me. He said, in my Father's house are many rooms, if it were not so, would I have told you that I go and prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. He is promising the second coming. And I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. And then he added one more phrase, a very important phrase. He said, he looked at him and he said, and you know the way to where I am going. You know the way to where I am going. Now, the disciples were puzzled by that statement. And it was Thomas who spoke up. He said, Lord, we do not know where you're going. You've been very cryptic about this. We don't know where you're going. You're going to disappear into Syria or something. How can we know the way? And Jesus answered Thomas with a truth for all people everywhere. He said, Thomas, I am the way and the truth and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. Solus Christus. The only way to the Father in heaven is through faith in Christ alone. You know, one man who truly championed this theological position was a Swiss reformer by the name of Ulrich Zwingli. Zwingli was a contemporary of Martin Luther. He was born on January 1st in 1484. That's less than two months after Luther was born, so they were the same age. Now, unfortunately, uh, Zwingli died in 1531 at the young age of 47. Luther um, lived until 1546, 15 years after Zwingli. But in 1516, one year before Luther posted his 95 theses in Germany, Zwingli got his hands on a copy of the Greek New Testament, the Bible in its original language, and that changed his life. Zwingli would later say that from that moment on, he was captivated by the Word of God. It's very similar to Luther's statement at the Diet of Worms that his conscience was captive to the Word of God. So they were thinking on the same plane. Zwingli's captivation to the Word led him to abandon the common practice of the day, which he was, he was a priest, and he abandoned uh, preaching on topical or allegorical homilies. And instead, he began to preach what are called expository sermons, meaning sermons which have as their main goal to help the hearer more fully understand what a Bible text is saying. Now, Luther had already begun to do the same thing down in Wittenberg, Germany. His expository preaching led him to question many of the teachings of the old Roman Catholic Church of that era. You know, things that I've talked about early in a few weeks ago, purgatory, indulgences, He questioned that on the grounds that that those things were found nowhere in Scripture. Meanwhile, over in Switzerland, in in, in Zurich, where Zwingli was, Zwingli was questioning any teaching or practice which seemed to suggest that the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross was not enough to save us from our sins. Like Luther, he he was opposed to indulgences in which people could offer up their own works for the forgiveness of their sins. He also opposed the practice of praying to the saints. He wouldn't allow it in his church anymore, since the saints, he said, did not die on the cross for your sins, and therefore had no power to speak to God on your behalf. He said that that we did not need to go to God through Mary or any of the other saints. We simply go through Jesus Christ. And Zwingli went a little farther than Luther on this issue. Zwingli also ordered the statues and stained glass windows that were depicting the saints to be destroyed because he felt that people were putting their trust in those images rather than in Christ alone. Luther, on the other hand, felt that the statues should stay and that the people should be simply taught how to honor the saints without praying to them. Luther said, we don't have to get rid of the statues, just we need to re-teach the people. But both Luther and Zwingli believed that the central teaching of the Bible was that Jesus Christ had done everything necessary to save us when he died on the cross for our sins and rose again from the dead on Easter Sunday. And because Jesus has done everything necessary for our salvation, <clears throat> it is an insult, said, said Zwingli, it is an insult to the sacrifice of Christ to say that there is anything that we can do for our salvation or that there is any way that we can please God and enter heaven except through faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. To quote Zwingli directly, he said, We know from the Old and New Testaments of God that our only comforter, redeemer, savior, and mediator with God is Jesus Christ, in whom and through whom alone we can obtain grace, help, and salvation, gifts which we can obtain from no other being in heaven or on earth. That is what is meant by the phrase solus Christus, in Christ alone. And so following the examples of Luther and Zwingli, I want to spend the next few minutes walking through the scriptures that they loved so much, looking for the evidence that Jesus Christ is our our one and only Lord and Savior. You know, there was a moment when I was a freshman in college when I had to make a very important decision, a decision that would determine the whole trajectory of the rest of my life. I was a Christian at the time, and I believed in Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But that year, through some of the classes that I was taking and through some of the books that I was reading and through a Bible study that I was attending in in my dorm, it began to dawn on me in a way that I had never contemplated it before, 
that everything that I believed about Jesus was, was based upon and contingent upon the reliability of this amazing book, the Bible, that I was just now starting to, to read and study with passion and purpose. And I had been thinking about that over a period of several weeks. And then one evening around 10 o'clock or so, I was walking from the library back to my dorm. I had my bag with, with, some, with my study books in it and walking on sidewalk, and I had this, this moment. I remember it was a cold January night, and there were, there were no clouds in the sky, so there were about a billion stars hanging over my head as I walked, and I had these questions about the Bible in my mind, questions that I had been wrestling with, and suddenly I just stopped on the sidewalk. I was along the back side of the science building, and, and there was no one else on that stretch of sidewalk at that moment that I could see. It was just me, and I looked up at the sky, and I said out loud, I said, God, I know I am never going to fully understand everything that is in this Bible. But I, I said, from this night on, I am going to believe that it is true. I am going to believe that it is reliable. I am going to believe that it is, it is your word. And I got back to my dorm room, and I, I just was filled with God's peace and with a powerful sense of certainty and conviction. In fact, I even sat down and wrote a letter to a good friend of mine from high school who was going to a different college. Uh, he, was over, he was over in Rock Island at Augustana at the time. And I wrote, wrote him this letter, and um, I poured my heart out to him. I said, this is the conviction I've come to. It, you know, talked about what had happened to me that night. He wrote back to me, and I could tell that he didn't quite know how to respond to what I had written, but they wrote a really nice letter back to me. And, and uh, he was a good friend. He had grown up in the Catholic Church, and, and a couple months after I had exchanged letters with him, I got this card in the mail saying that a Catholic Mass had been said for me. <laughs> and there was no name on the card, but I knew it was from him. <laughs> it was his way of affirming me, of, in, of encouraging me. But I'm telling you that whole long story because it explains what I'm going to tell you next. And that is that once I started reading the Bible with absolute faith and trust in its origin and its reliability, I began to see the truth about Jesus Christ just jumping off the pages at me. From the opening chapters of the book of Genesis to the closing chapters of the book of Revelation, Jesus is everywhere. And Luther said the same thing. He kept seeing Jesus all over this Bible. And, and this is what Jesus is talking about in John 5, 39, when he said that the scriptures bear witness about me. And he was talking about the Old Testament scriptures. He said the Old Testament scriptures bear witness about me. He said that to the scribes and Pharisees. The scriptures tell us two important things about Jesus. They tell us who he is, and they tell us what he has done. So let's take a look first at what the Bible says about who Jesus is. In John chapter 1, we are immediately confronted with the incredible reality that Jesus is both preexistent and that he is also co-equal with God the Father. Jesus calls John the logos, which is the Greek word that means word. And he tells us in the very first verse of his gospel, he phrases it like the first verse of Genesis. In the beginning, John says, in the beginning was the Word, Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John is telling us that, that before Jesus was born into this world, as a little baby in Bethlehem, before that, he already existed. In fact, John was telling us he has always existed just as the Father has always existed, just as the Holy Spirit has always existed, John tells us immediately at the start of his gospel that Jesus is God. And then in verse 14 of chapter 1, John tells us that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus became a human being, was born in that manger. Matthew and Luke tell us that he was born of a woman, the Virgin Mary, but he was not conceived in the normal way by the union of a man and a woman. Instead, he was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, because he was not conceived in the normal way, he was not born with original sin, and he never sinned in his entire life on this earth. 1 Peter 2.22 says that Jesus committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. But in every other way, Jesus was human. He worked, he sweat, he ate, he slept, he laughed, he cried, he bled, he died. He was fully human, but he was also fully God at all times. 
Hebrews chapter 1 tells us of the transcendence of Jesus. It tells us that he is the uncreated one, meaning he always existed. In John 8, 58, Jesus calls himself, I am, which is the English translation of the Hebrew word Yahweh, which is the name of God in the Old Testament. In John 10, 30, Jesus also claims equality with God. He says, I and the Father are one. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus claims that he can forgive sins, something that only God has the power to do. And throughout the Gospels, Jesus speaks with the authority of God. Jesus does miracles with the power of God. Jesus is acknowledged and worshipped as God, even by demons. When Thomas sees Jesus after the resurrection, he falls to his, his knees and says, My Lord and my God. And Paul says about Jesus in Titus 2.13 that Jesus is our great God and Savior. And those are only a few of the Bible passages that attest to the fact that Jesus is both God and man. He is God in the flesh. That's what the Bible says about who Jesus is. But the Bible also talks extensively about what Jesus has done. As I've already mentioned, one of the things that Jesus accomplished when he lived on this earth as a man was that he never sinned, never once. In fact, Jesus is the only human being to ever do that. He was the only perfect human being. And if he had just lived out his life here on the earth and ascended back into heaven, he would have been welcomed back by the Father and the Spirit because of his perfect good works. But we know that Jesus came to do much more than that. Jesus came to sacrifice his perfect life for the sake of sinners. We know that the Jewish leaders arrested Jesus. We know that the Roman governor Pontius Pilate sentenced him to death on a cross, but they had no real power over him. Jesus said about himself in John 10, 18, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. And for what reason did he lay it down? He laid it down in order to accomplish the work of substitution. He died in the place of sinners. Isaiah 53 says, Surely he has borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. So we did the sin. He got afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement, the punishment that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. (laughs) All we like sheep have gone astray, says Isaiah. We have turned everyone to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Now that is Isaiah prophesying about the substitutionary death of Jesus 700 years before it happened. And the apostles bear witness to this same truth after the fact. Peter says in 1 Peter 2.24, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. He's almost quoting Isaiah 53 there. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he, God the Father, made him to be sin, Jesus who knew no sin so that in him, Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. The Bible also tells us that by substituting himself for us, Jesus, the sinless Lamb of God, redeemed us. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6.20 that we were bought for a price. Jesus paid the penalty for our sins. He bought us back from the power of Satan, who had become our slave master. And by his death, Jesus also accomplished the work of propitiation, says Paul. This means he satisfied the Father's righteous anger for our sin. The Bible tells us that although God loves sinners, he hates sin. And we could never, ever live in God's presence in heaven unless our sin was taken care of in some way. So God the Father put the sins of the world on Jesus the Son, and he allowed Jesus to bear those sins and die for those sins and descend into hell as a penalty for those sins. So Jesus bore the wrath of God against sin. And now, when we believe in Jesus Christ, when we believe in what he has done for us, the Father forgives our sins. 
He counts us as righteous, says Paul, for Jesus' sake. We call this justification. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, he says, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself, gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. When Jesus rose from the grave on Easter Sunday, that was the proof that God had accepted his sacrifice on our behalf. And the resurrection of Jesus promises that all who believe in him will also rise from the dead just as he did. And we will be welcomed into heaven just as Jesus was welcomed back 40 days after his resurrection. So those are the biblical facts about who Jesus is and what he has done for us. The testimony of the Bible is undeniable. No other method, no other means, no other person could accomplish our redemption, our salvation, our regeneration, our justification, or our resurrection. Only Christ could accomplish those things for us. Only Christ alone. And so we resist all those things in the world which in any way would diminish the importance of what Jesus has done. And the Reformers identified a number of things in the church of their day that were they considered to be affronts to Solus Christus. Let me mention a few that Nate Pickowitz mentions in his book. He, he talks about the sacrifice of the Mass in the way it was understood in that day. It, it has changed some in our day, but in the way it was understood in that day. In the days of Luther and Zwingli, the church considered the sacrifice of the Mass to be a continuation of the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. But Hebrews 9.26 tells us that by his death on the cross, Jesus has died once for all. He put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. So while Luther said that the body and the blood of Jesus were truly present in the bread and wine of Holy Communion, that ceremony, he said, was in no way a sacrifice. Holy Communion was simply a special way that Jesus is present among his people. And so we don't, we don't talk about the sacrifice of the Mass. We talk about celebrating Holy Communion. Another thing that Luther rejected as unbiblical was the idea that the saints have a treasury of merit. Now, this was the idea in the medieval church that the saints were so righteous that they had all these excess good works which believers could draw on to their own benefit. The idea that there is a treasury of merit led to the false doctrines of purgatory and indulgences and praying to the saints, asking them to intercede to God on our behalf, on the basis of their treasury of merit. But the total testimony of the scriptures tells us that the saints, although they have, may have been great men and women of the faith, were also sinful human beings, just like we are. They needed Jesus just as much as we do. And so, although it may be a good thing to study the lives of the saints and learn from their faithful lives, Luther said we should never pray to them we should pray to God only, and we should pray through Christ only, who is the only one who can intercede for us with the Father. And then a third thing that Luther and other reformers saw as an affront to the concept of solus Christus was the temptation to put human leaders in the place of God. In Luther's day, the Pope and the bishops held absolute power over the church and over the people. They refused to even let the people read the Bible for themselves. In fact, they considered it to be heresy to translate the Bible into any language other than Latin. They did not want the people to do what Luther did. They did not want them to use the Bible to question the actions of their leaders. They simply wanted people to obey. But Luther rejected this idea. He said that the only true leader of the church is Christ himself. And, and, and the only true guide for all matters of faith and life is the word of God in the Bible. People must have access to the word of God and they must hold their leaders accountable to that word. At the Diet of Worms, Luther said, I do not put my trust in popes and councils, for popes and councils often err and contradict each other. He said, my conscience is captive to the word of God. Here I stand, I can do no other thing. To put any human being or any institution in, in, in a place above God's word, Luther said, is an affront to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who alone is the head of the church. Jesus said, I am the way, 
and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We do not look to earthly saviors, nor do we rely on the intercession of saints. Neither religious rituals, nor pious prayers, nor earthly sacrifices, nor extravagant offerings or human merits can ever accomplish the work of our salvation. Peter said in Acts 4.12 that there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. We are saved through faith in Christ alone. Christ alone. Solus Christus. Amen and amen.